Hello, I'm Demis Helen and welcome to my Melodic Techno series. I'm going to be guiding you through my Melodic Techno project and I'm going to be showing you various elements. The episodes are going to cover the leads mixing, the bass mixing, the Atmos creation using some time stretching and the mixing using pink noise and a few other tips and tricks to make sure it's punchy and clear. Now that's enough from me, let's have a listen to a snippet of the track that we are working with in this series. Okay, so episode number one, let's have a look at the leads, the pads, the strings, the Atmos. We're going to do a separate video on the Atmos, but I'm just going to use that as context for what we're going to call the environment, uh, the bubble of the track for it to sit in. And these three folders are containing all of the parts that are used. And as a quick disclaimer, everything is Cubase related in this project. There are no third party plugins or instruments. The only thing that is third party is this vocal line down here and my percussion parts, but you can get those from the download because they are mine and I'm happy to give them for you to use. So this one, I'll give you a link to this vocal if you want to purchase the pack to get this exact vocal, but it's not detrimental to the track, but the option is there if you want this vocal. So we'll start by using the leads and arps as our starting point. We'll listen to certain parts of the track so you can get ideas of how they sound in context and then we'll isolate them and just have a, a little bit of a deeper dive. So you can hear it's creating quite the atmosphere using these sounds. Now there's lots of reverb in here, but it's all about the individual placement. So if we take a look at the starting point for this track, which was this particular melody track here, if we just play this one, let's open this sidebar. So believe it or not, that was the start of the track that sparked everything off that little melodic hit. And it was in that sound as well everything else just came around. So you can hear there's a lot of space in there and there's a lot of space in some of the other elements, um, apart from this mini arp, which is more centralized, but I'll show you how I kind of pushed some details out into the sides as well. Um, but let's have a look at what's going on here. So sound design first, Retrolog 2, great sounding synth. Really enjoyed using this again for making this track. Um, this one is a square wave, but shaped into a pulse using the wave shaper. A little bit of white noise on the top to give it a bit of sparkle and a little bit of grit. And you can see I've just mixed that in a little bit there. This then goes through an LP24, um, a little bit of shaping on the envelope there, and you can see we've got more of a pluck, um, but it doesn't open up the filter too much. So if we go to a section where this has the filter closed, like at the beginning, you can hear it plucks a little bit, but not too much. And the reason for that is I wanted to keep it nice and subdued in the background, because it's not really the main focus, but it's a support element. And just a note, the voicing is in mono retrig, so essentially legato. If we hold one note and press another, it will just take priority. Let's just turn this uh, filter up. So you can see I kept hold of the left note and the right note took over every time I pressed it, so legato mode. So let's have a look at the audio insert chain. So we've got a compressor, we've got some reverb, delay, a filter and razor on the end. So razor is just acting as a gain function. So I'm just using it as a gain knob. That's the only reason it's there. So we've got some heavy compression going on. I'm just really squashing this sound down so it can't have too much dynamic in the track and it becomes a part that is really sort of sitting in the background and just complementing the track. Which then goes into Roomworks and this is where the magic starts. So you can see four seconds on the reverb time, cutting out a lot of the lows you can see using the dampening and input filters, and then a sort of healthy mix there. So we've got a little bit of wash over the sound, very little pre-delay on this one. And this comes after the compressor. I don't want the compressor to incorporate the reverb into its uh, signal. So I put it after, so it sits on the compressed signal. 
And that is the main reason why I've put the Roomworks and the stereo delay after the compressor, because I want them to sort of affect the compressed signal rather than the other way around, and then it compress all that down. Stereo delay, we've got quarter notes and quarter dotted notes with high feedback and a lot of the lows cut out there. So you can see nearly 600 Hertz on each, just to make sure that the kick and bass have all the room they need and this is not interfering because you're gonna run into trouble. But if we take a look at the automation, there is a lot. Um, but let's just explain it really briefly. Um, there's not really that much going on when you look at it. We've got the feedbacks of the two delays. We've got the reverb on Roomworks, so the reverb time and the mix on Roomworks. And all I'm doing is alternating these on and off. So this goes to 20 seconds of reverb and full feedback on these two. So if we look at them again, let's just put these up here. You can see now 20 seconds and the feedbacks are at 100. But if I move over to this section where it drops down on the automation, you can see now it's got four seconds and these are at 74 and 73 percent on the feedback. So the reason for this is to wash out the sound in certain parts of the track, but then help the decay fall off quicker by dropping the amounts. So that's the reason why they drop there, which then gives way to this analog lead. Sometimes it doesn't happen because I just want it to continue and just wash over. So it just gives it a little bit of extra dynamic and you can see all the way across this is happening. Which then brings me into the analog lead. So if we just close down all this automation, and by the way, the modulation wheel is being automated here to open and close the filter. So now with the analog lead, if we look at what this is doing, we've got a saw wave going straight through into an LP24. You can see the envelope is open quite a bit, um, but we've got a very slow attack and a sort of slow decay rate there as well and also on the amp envelope. So we get a nice swell of the sound and we're using the LFOs here to modulate the pitch to simulate that analog style. So it just gives it a bit of movement and detaches it from the rest of the monotony of the track. And again, we have copied down the melody to this one and then I've redesigned the Retrolog patch. So you can see that the compression is the same. The room works is roughly the same, but I've changed up the reverb time. There's no automation on this. And I've just tweaked it up a little bit. And this is how I like to work. Instead of using sends, I like to use individual reverbs. As long as you're keeping it in the same sort of ballpark, but it gives me the option to have different reverb times. I can just change up the size a little bit, roll out more lows, bring more in, depending on what the sound is. So it just gives me more control over the sound overall. Same with the stereo delay. You can see we've got full feedback on this and that is what's keeping that sound just keeps going and pulsing through as the analog lead has finished. It'll continue to sort of swell through this area before the next one starts. And a dual filter. Um, if you haven't used dual filter before, you should be using this. This is a high pass and a low pass. Left for the low pass and right for the high pass. So you've just got both at your disposal without having to load any other plugins or EQs. And it just gives you some quick, easy, fast results. Okay, so now moving on to the mini ARP. This is where the bass is supported by the drive of this mini ARP. It's not really meant to be heard as an upfront instrument. It is meant to be a support instrument that kind of sits in the background and just does its thing. Um, you can hear it clearly, but I'll show you what I mean, how I've kind of made it sit further in the background. So that's the sound we're working with. Let's solo this in and just have a quick look at the sound design. So you can hear it's quite blippy but these automations allow the decay to open to make the notes longer. So really they're just to add crescendos, swells, transitions, so I can make it heard when needed. So let's have a look at the sound design first. This is Retrolog 2. We've got a saw wave going straight into an LP12. 
and this is where the sound is different. So I usually use the filter envelope to control the pluckiness of a sound using the filter, but this time we've sort of opened it up. So it's quite a sort of long sustained note, but it's not fully like full volume. Whereas the actual stabbiness and the pluckiness is coming from here. So everything is pretty much zeroed apart from the decay. So we've got 90 milliseconds at its lowest and then this opens up to obviously let more of this shape take over from the filter envelope, giving you a bigger sound. And you can hear that's how I can then bring it to the front of the mix and then push it back again really quickly. So if you look at the automation, if I put it here, you can see the decay is moving up. At its peak, you can see it's there at five and a half thousand milliseconds as opposed to 90 where it started. So again, the process is roughly the same. We've got Roomworks. I am making micro adjustments. Uh, you'll notice that the reverb here is at one second. I'll explain that in a second, but you can see that we've got the lows cut out again. We've got a bit of a higher mix and everything is sort of exactly where it is for the analog lead and the melody. But we've got one second on the reverb time. So I wanted this to stay sharp, centered and sort of dry in a sense with the reverb. But I still wanted it there so it didn't sound too dry that it just sort of didn't fit into the mix. So using a little bit and just a very short reverb gives it that sort of bathroom effect and keeps it separate, but at the same time integrates into the mix a little bit better whilst retaining the transients of that really clicky bit at the beginning of each note. So the problem I had here is it was very centered in the mix. So to simulate a little bit of width without making it wider using reverb and other things, I used some ping pong delay. Quarter note dotted, and you can see I've just rolled out some of the lows up to about 300 hertz, and same with the highs, just rolled them off a little bit, and then just mixed it into taste on how it sounds, and that's going to give you sort of the left and right, but it's not going to fall apart in a mono mix because it's still quite centered, but just gives it a little bit more room in the stereo space. So you can see it just gives it a little bit of movement, not too much, and it's very subtle, but it does the job. Razor is acting as a gain again, and then the envelope shaper here, we're adding on 2 dB onto the attack to just sharpen it up a little bit. So the problem I had during mixing is this was falling into the background a little bit too much. It sounded a bit too soft, even though it's still quite sharp. And instead of turning up the level on the mixer or a gain, it pushed it too far into the forefront and then all the other elements were not quite sitting right. So instead, just increase the attack by 2 dB to let that sort of snap cut through the mix a little bit and support the bass line. And just for those that are not familiar with the envelope shaper, let me just simulate that for you by turning this up. So I'm just increasing the very front end of the sound to make it cut through the mix a bit more. So return that to two and we're all good. So that's really sort of the main elements of the track. We have the end lead, which I'm going to talk about in just a second, but I'm just going to turn our attention to the Atmos because we have a few elements in here that sort of counter what uh, is happening up in the leads. So the main melody up here, as I mentioned before, has got that nice wash of reverb. It's where the track started. So I want to sort of carry that theme on, but with the atmospheres. So I'm trying to create a call and answer. And by the time that's happened, the analog leads coming in. So it's like there's a conversation between all the instruments happening. And then the same happens here. The stretch Atmos 1 and 2 are hard panned left and right. And these are time stretched versions of this, but one octave higher. And I've got one that's time stretched double the length and I've got one time stretch three quarters of the length but I'll show you that later on in episode three and how I created those. So 
So you start to build up this environment for your track to appear in and it starts telling its own story once you get the balance right. So that's the Atmos. We'll look at them later. Let's turn our attention to the final part, which is the end lead. As suggested, it is the end lead. It is in the breakdown, but it is subdued and then sort of filters in at the end to sort of signify the build and the drop is coming. And then this is the sort of crescendo of the track where it actually plays in full. So let's listen to it in context first. Okay, so it was imperative that this lead had something unique about it and also helped to develop that sensation of the crescendo, the final part of the track. And that was done by using Retrolog 2 and these two effects here, but I'll show you in a second those. This is a multi saw, so this is essentially a super saw. I've got five voices and a very low detune rate, so that means that the voices aren't spread out as much, there's more packed together and it gives you the sense of thickness rather than width and then on top of that I have a chorus adding some more thickness in there to generate a more authentic sort of sound towards the super saw even though we're not trying to create a super saw. So that goes through an LP24 and the way this one works is we use the envelope to sort of decay the cutoff here so it'll open up the cutoff and then it will decay at the rate I've chosen to the sustain level. And if you turn your attention to the sustain on the amp mod, it's at 100%. So if I just hold a key, it's just going to keep hold of that note and it's just going to play forever until I let go. So you can see how it fades off from being fully open on the cutoff and then holding that position at that sustain level. But where the magic happens, I wanted this to stand out and be different in the track. So we've got that extra bit of chorusing on there to thicken it up. But then the reverb adds a bathroom texture to it, as I call it. It's a smaller reverb. So adding that in gives it a unique sound, a unique texture. And then on top of that, we can do the third party processing, or should we say the audio inserts, there is no third party plugins. The Roomworks here is contributing another eight seconds of reverb time, very little lows coming through on this and quite a high mix. So it really washes into the mix and it doesn't have any sort of sharp points. It's meant to be smooth and just full of texture and life. Talking about adding compression after or before reverb, most of it has been done before the reverbs added. In this case, I've used the squasher which is Steinberg's answer to OTT. And in my opinion, there's a lot more functionality than OTT, including like the attack release drive and the gate functions, as well as the individual channel mixes. There's just a lot more going on here. So all that's happening is band one's ignored. Band two and three, we're pushing the expansion, so the upwards on this one more to give it more presence, a little bit of compression on the top, and then this is more compressed than uh, any expansion. So this one's compressing down, this one's expanding. You can see more compression and more expansion. And we've got a 70-30 split, so we've got 30% of the original signal coming through on top of that. And just to note, if you are going to be A, B in these, make sure you match your output to the original input levels. When you turn them on and off, you can hear exactly what is happening to the sound. And then just a little bit of frequency on the end, just rolling out the lows and controlling how much of the side detail is in that lower end. So that is the leads and the Atmoses sort of explained in 
how they are shaping and making that bubble for our track. But let's have a look at the pads and strings. It's only for the breakdown. They don't appear anywhere else in the track. They don't need to. idea you can see all of the other things start to take back over of these and the whole track starts expanding back into what it was and creating that atmosphere so i'm just going to correct one thing in my kick and bass section the kick verb is a little bit boomy it kind of really destroyed the track so um for now i'm just going to roll it out and i'll address that later So let's just have a quick look at what's going on here. We've got Roomworks on a Hallian electric piano. I think it's a Rhodes or something. Um, not focusing on the lows again with this one and sort of taming the highs as well, but giving it a nice long reverb time so we can sort of accentuate the harmonics of that sound. Um, that is the Tremolo Mark II, and I've just boosted the volume. Nothing else has been changed down here or anything, and it just comes out as it is. Then we've got an Atmos layer. So this was a redundant layer after making an Atmos part for the Atmos folder. And then I decided that it sounded quite nice as an accompaniment for this break. So it's really not meant to be heard. It's just adding some extra texture to the sound. And it's a lot higher than the rest of the sounds. And then the strings then appear on top of that which are a pad shop. It's the awakening preset. And you can see with that, that is the middle section. We've just got room works on there, but we haven't got any processing on these two tracks here at all. Goes into the pads mix. We've got a frequency on there. So we're just rolling out some of the lows to control the like super low detail that we might not need. And then we've just got the vintage compressor on here. So there we are. That brings us to the end of this episode. Hopefully you can see now how I've created the environment and the atmosphere for the track to sit in. And with that said, I've been Demis Helen and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Take care. <laughs>